And again, uh, the expression of the chairman's view of a draconian cut that would take place as a result of sequestration. Secretary of Defense has testified before our committee of the, quote, devastating effects as have the majority, uh, excuse me, our, our, our military leaders. Uh, these cuts that would result from sequestration are massive, not just in defense, but also in non-defense uh, discretionary uh, areas. Uh, the purpose of that uh, threat is to hopefully avoid it from taking, uh, prevent it from taking place. It's like any other kind of a sword of Damocles holding uh, over people's heads, our heads, uh, that if we don't reach some kind of an agreement uh, with our uh, special committee, our, our group of 12 that are working so hard to come up with a uh, reduction that will meet the requirements of the bill, that we would then have a sequestration across the board cuts, which are not the rational way to budget, are massive, draconian, to use the word which the Senator from Arizona quoted, and that's true in both defense and non-defense. Um, but again, the purpose of having those of having that sequestration process in place is hopefully an incentive so that it doesn't take place. Finally, I'd, I'd ask uh, the chairman, um, we have met the requirements of the Appropriations Committee with this 20, additional $20 billion reduction in this, quote, new uh, legislation. Then it seems that it would be only appropriate that the Appropriations Committee meet the provisions of authorization that are in the authorization bill. In other words, um, there are, I'm told, some differences in the Appropriations Committee's bill as far as what authorizing committee's responsibilities are. Um, I hope that the Appropriations Committee would address those differences in deference to our role as authorizers. That's always our hope. Uh, it doesn't work out that way, uh, the way we would like frequently, but it is always our hope and the way it should work, at least theoretically around here, is that uh, that should be what the uh, appropriators do. Now, it has not worked out that way and I don't know how many recent years you and I have had some discussions about that and I, as I, when I first got here uh, many years ago, that was an issue. It has not been resolved, but I think what the Senator sets out is the hope that uh, the appropriators uh, would uh, look at our authorization and follow our authorizations. Well, I thank, I thank uh, the Senator from Michigan, and I just would finally like to comment. I'm more than hoping, I, I intend to identify those areas of difference between the authorizing committee and the appropriations committee and fully expect the appropriating committee unless there is some overriding reason to conform with the authorization bill. And again, I want to thank Senator Levin and his staff for the work that we are doing. I hope we'll be allowed to consider the, uh, and I want to thank the leadership. I want to thank Senator Reid for bringing the bill to the floor. And uh, I know he has a lot of uh, important priorities, uh, but I believe that it's very important that we continue a over half century tradition of the Senate taking up, passing, and then finally into seeing enacted into law the defense authorization bill. I think it's a valid statement to say that there is no greater priority that the people's representatives have than to ensure the security, take every measure we can possibly to ensure the security of our nation and the men and women who serve in it. And uh, this legislation is a result of literally thousands of hours of discussion, debate, hearings, input, and to uh, make sure that we do the very best job we can to protect our nation. And as I mentioned earlier, with the committee's action earlier this week, we've ensured that our authorization top line of $526 billion for the base defense budget complies with the budget allocation levels adopted by the Senate Appropriations Committee for fiscal year 2012. We've worked with the administration over the past several weeks to address their concerns with the detainee provisions in our bill. Now, we understand that the administration is still not satisfied 
with the committee work. We made many clarifications, modifications at the request of the administration to the detainee provisions as they were reported from the committee in June. And as a result, we were able to report out the bill again this week with an overwhelming bipartisan vote of 26 to nothing. We will be glad to continue our discussions with the administration. I am grateful that the administration reached out to us and that because of that discussion and negotiations uh, with Mr. Brennan and others from the White House, we were able to make some changes. I regret that they haven't been sufficient uh, uh, to overcome their objections, but we will continue to work with them. This is a very, very important issue. Obviously, all of us' goal is to make sure that members of terrorist organizations, specifically Al-Qaeda, do not return to the fight and that we make sure that we are able to treat Al-Qaeda members who are captured with, in keeping with international law, but at the same time in keeping with the priority interests of America's national security. So I understand there will be an amendment on that issue or amendments. I look forward to debating and discussing that aspect. Whatever additional concerns that may re remain with the detainee provisions should be dealt with as it will be through debate and amendment. But uh, importantly, all of the aspects of, the other bill, of this bill are of such vital importance to supporting the men and women of our armed forces and their families. We've already started to work on amendments that we know our colleagues are preparing to offer on this bill, and I encourage all my colleagues to file their germane amendments as quickly as possible. Obviously, as I repeat, the legislation is extremely important to our nation's defense and the men and women in uniform. I know all of my colleagues appreciate that fact. I would hope that this year, unlike in recent previous years, that we will not add to this bill policy riders that are not relevant to the bill. The committee bill before the Senate is the culmination of 11 months of hard work conducted through 71 hearings and meetings this year on the full range of national security priorities and issues. This tradition of deliberate review and oversight is typical of what the Defense Authorization Bill has provided our nation's military for over 50 years without fail. The committee's priorities this year and every year start with our bipartisan commitment to improve the quality of life of the men and women of the all-volunteer force active duty, National Guard, and Reserves, and their families through fair pay, improved policies, benefits commensurate with the sacrifices of their service, and by addressing the needs of the wounded, ill, and injured service members and their families. <coughs> to do these things, this bill authorizes a 1.6 percent across the board pay raise for all members of the uniformed services, authorizes pay incentives for recruitment and retention, of our most highly skilled and highly sought after men and women, and improves the Uniform Code of Military Justice to more effectively respond to accusations of certain types of misconduct. This bill provides essential resources, training, technology, equipment, and force protection our military needs to succeed in their missions, including authorizing a 6% increase in funding for our enormously important professional and dedicated special operations forces who play such a large role in our counterterrorism operations worldwide, and over $2.4 billion for the Department of Defense's counter-improved explosive device, counter-IED activities. <clears throat> I cannot overemphasize the importance of the timely funding of these counter-IED funds given the increase in the use of this kind of attack against our troops first in Iraq and now in Afghanistan. The bill enhances the capability of our military and that of our allies to conduct counterinsurgency operations, including the authority to provide support to those aiding U.S. special operations in combating terrorism in Yemen and East Africa, authorization of $400 million for the Commander's Emergency Response Program, known as SERP, in Afghanistan, an authorization of $11.1 billion to train and equip the Afghan security forces for the security of the Afghan people. 
The bill strengthens and accelerates nuclear nonproliferation programs while maintaining a credible nuclear deterrent, reducing the number of nuclear weapons, and ensuring the safety, security, and reliability of the nuclear stockpile, the delivery systems, and the nuclear infrastructure. In this regard, the bill authorizes $1.1 billion to continue development of the Ohio-class submarine replacement program to modernize the sea-based leg of the nuclear triad of delivery platforms. It improves our ability to counter non-traditional threats, focusing on terrorism and cyber warfare, in part by requiring DOD to acquire and incorporate capabilities for discovering previously unknown cyber attacks and establishing a new joint urgent operational need fund to allow the department to rapidly field new systems in response to battlefield requirements. It authorizes DOD to immediately void a contract if a contractor has been determined by the commander U.S. Central Command to be actively opposing U.S. forces in Afghanistan. A related provision would provide enhanced audit authority to assist in the enforcement of this provision. It authorizes over $13 billion for new construction of critical facility projects that have a direct impact on the readiness and operations of our military, while also providing much needed construction jobs in a struggling economy. In contrast to these enhancements and new authorities, the committee also had to make some very difficult decisions. The President's budget request of $553 billion was cut by nearly $27 billion in recognition of the difficult budget situation our country faces. These difficult funding reductions include $10 billion cut in the operation and maintenance accounts for the military services used to fund readiness and training activities. This was done mainly by scaling back the growth and service contracts while also reducing certain accounts for daily operating activities and training. A $9.8 billion cut in defense procurement accounts for programs that had more money than could be efficiently put under contract this year and programs that were not able to meet production milestones. A $3.5 billion cut in the research, development, test, and evaluation accounts by examining the performance of hundreds of programs and identifying those that showed excessive cost growth or a lack of performance. $1.6 billion in cut in military construction projects, mostly at overseas locations, to allow for a review of our U.S. military force posture worldwide. In addition, the bill cut $6.7 billion from the President's budget request of $118 billion for overseas contingency operations known as OCO due to a forecast of reduced operations in Afghanistan during 2012. These cuts are the first step in what will be an extremely critical debate on the right amount of defense spending over the next 10 years. We will need to make some very difficult decisions that will undoubtedly increase risk as we decide whether to continue or terminate costly and in some cases troubled and overdue programs. We will need an informed and honest debate on which defense requirements and capab capabilities most effectively and efficiently protect the full range of our nation's interest. As such, this committee's review and curtailment of troubled, wasteful, or unnecessary programs is not only essential to ensure proper stewardship of taxpayers' funds, but also true to the intent of preserving funds for warfighter priorities. Along these lines, this bill proposes to cut $452 million for the Enhanced Medium Altitude Reconnaissance and Surveillance System due to program delays, $192 million from, the, from related Brigade Combat Team Modernization Projects due to a program termination by the Army, $200 million for the Joint Tactical Radio System due to program delays, $406 million for the Medium Extended Air Defense Systems, known as MEADS, which is a high-risk joint program for air defense with Germany and Italy, which the Army has decided not to deploy operationally. $500 million for the Joint Tactical Radio System, called Jitters, 
such as a, as a result of program execution and cost concerns. $244 million for Warfighter Information Network Tactical. $173 million for Ground Soldier Systems Net Warrior. $157 million for HMMWV recapitalization programs. $108.6 million for unnecessary post-production funding for the C-17 program. $233 million due to slow execution in the development of the family of advanced line-of-sight terminals used in conjunction with the advanced extremely high-frequency satellite systems. $300 million by curtailing authority for long-term lease of a commercial satellite by the Defense Information Systems Agency due to a lack of an analysis of alternatives. $105 million in connection with delays in contract awards associated with GPS systems under development. Even after this long list of cuts to trouble programs, I would have liked to have done more. And I want to point out that in the days when we were increasing defense spending, it was one thing not to be in sync with the Appropriations Committee. In the days of reductions in defense spending, it is absolutely vital that the Appropriations Committee follow the guidance and authorization of the Authorizing Committee. And I intend to do everything in my power to make sure that that happens. Now, an example of what I would like to have seen more is the Joint Fight Strike Fighter, or the F-35 program. I offered an amendment during the committee's markup that would have put the program on a one-year probation if the costs under the fixed-price contract for the fourth lot of early production aircraft grew by more than 10 percent over their target cost by the end of the year. My goal was to send a strong, simple, and powerful message to the Pentagon and to Lockheed Martin a message that we will no longer continue down the road of excessive cost growth and schedule slips on this program just because other alternatives are hard to come by. We now are faced with the prospect of the first trillion dollar weapon system in history, which certainly was not originally designed to do so. As it turned out, the amendment didn't go forward as a result of a tie vote and an alternative provision offered by the chairman, Chairman Levin, will instead require that the fifth lot of early production F-35 aircraft be procured under a fixed price contract and that Lockheed Martin bear the entire responsibility for any cost overrun other than certain limited costs needed to make specific changes that the government requests. Because I feel that it is essential to use fixed price, fixed price contracts for large Pentagon weapons programs. I supported the Chairman's amendment during the markup, and I support it now. Today, today, as we speak, the Pentagon is negotiating with Lockheed Martin on who will bear the cost of changes to the design and manufacturing of the aircraft that could come down the road as a result of thousands of hours flight testing that lie ahead. In this sense, the excessive overlap between development and production that is called concurrency is now coming home to roost. The Defense Department, quite rightly, says it will not sign any contract for the next lot until a Lockheed Martin agrees to pay a reasonable share of these, quote, concurrency costs, and Lockheed Martin doesn't want to bear the risk of new discoveries. Let me be clear. I strongly support the Department of Defense position. I think it reflects exactly the congressional view reflected in our markup. As we agree to buy more early production jets, while most of the development testing is yet to be done, Lockheed Martin must be held increasingly accountable for cost overruns that come as a result of wringing out necessary changes in the design and manufacturing process for this incredibly expensive aircraft. How does this legislation affect pending negotiations? It means that on the next production line, Congress expects the Department to negotiate a fixed price contract that requires Lockheed Martin to assume an increased share of any cost overruns. It requires a ceiling price for that lot that is lower than the previous contract for the last lot purchased. It requires a shared, it ensures a shared responsibility for reasonable concurrency cost increases. In other words, 
The deal we negotiate on this next production lot must be at least as good, if not better, than the deal we negotiated under the previous one. Otherwise, we're moving in the wrong direction, and it will only be a matter of time before the American people and the U.S. Congress lose faith with the F-35 program, which is already the most expensive weapons program in the history of this country. I look forward to having the opportunity to address this and other significant national security policies related to detainee policies, cyber operations, Iranian aggression, Pakistan, acquisition reform and the way we buy space programs and launch services, further limiting the use of fixed price contracts for procurement, reducing the cost of military health care, counterfeit parts, and the future of our military in the face of major budget reductions. On the issue of counterfeit parts, I want to commend the initiative of the, chair, of the chairman to address this critical issue. The proliferation of counterfeit parts threatens the safety of our men and women in uniform, our national security, and our economy. We cannot risk a ballistic missile interceptor missing its target, or a helicopter pilot unable to fire his or her weapons, or display units failing in aircraft cockpits, or any other system failure, all because of a counterfeit electronic part. Nor can we keep affording the hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars, to fix the systems that they penetrate. Our committee has been conducting an investigation for the past year, and we will have an amendment, and there's one already pending as a result of this outstanding work. I also plan to offer amendments that will start us on the course of an updated plan for U.S. military forces in the Pacific Theater. The current plan is to move 8,700 Marines and 9,000 family members from their current bases on Okinawa to Guam is now estimated to require spending between 18 and $23 billion on Guam to build up its capabilities as a permanent base. This is an increase of well over $10 billion from the original estimate. And I believe the price tag will continue to rise. As a result, I, along with Chairman Levin and Senator Webb and other colleagues, view this plan as unworkable, unaffordable, and an unnecessary strain on the relations between our government and the government of Japan. Recognizing this strain, both the Armed Services Committee and the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Committee of the Appropriations Committee have stopped funding Guam military construction projects until the Department of Defense provides a master plan and considers alternatives that may provide the needed Marine forward presence at much less expense. Let's face it, we simply are at a level that we cannot afford under the present plan. And I also understand that our relations with Japan are very important in this whole move. We cannot send a signal that America is leaving the area. In fact, I was very pleased to see the agreement that the President of the United States signed with the Prime Minister of Australia just yesterday that provides for a joint operating base in Australia. But we must understand the delicacy of our relations with the government and people of Japan, especially in the time of rising concern about some of the behavior that has been exhibited by the Chinese. I believe, we should, I believe we need to take advantage of this pause to convene a congressional commission of experts in Asian affairs with multilateral input to review our national security interests in the Pacific region over the next 30 years and charter that commission to propose a posture for our military forces that will both strengthen our traditional alliances while offering opportunities for cooperative efforts with emerging partners and allies to solidify our mutual interests in the region. In the face of the doubt about the scope and timing of the Pacific realignments, we also need to ensure that this pause in potentially unnecessary spendings extended in 2012 to the use of defense funds to activities that have no direct impact on military functions or missions on Guam, such as the purchase of civilian school buses, an artifact repository, and a mental health clinic in Guam. While these projects may have legitimate value to the government of Guam to address current needs for citizens of Guam, 
They simply are not my idea of top defense priorities in the fiscal environment we face. In addition, despite the efforts of Congress to ban earmarks and special interest projects, this bill contains almost $850 million in authorizations of funding for items and programs not requested by the administration. The full Senate needs to consider the merits of these unrequested spending items and to determine whether they are top defense priorities in today's fiscal environment. The bill also cuts $330 million for private sector care under the Defense Health Program based on an assessment of historical under-execution rates. This is the first step in important progress in helping the Department of Defense control spiraling health care costs. But as with other challenges we faced in this bill, we could have and should have done more. Secretary Panetta, speaking at the Woodrow Wilson Center in October of this year, said, and I quote, the fiscal reality facing us means that we also have to look at the growth in personnel costs, which are a major driver of budget growth and are simply put on an unsustainable course. The Secretary concludes, if we fail to address these costs, then we won't be able to afford the training and equipment our troops need in order to succeed on the battlefield. Providing the Department with the authority to adjust TRICARE prime enrollment fees based on a realistic index of national health expenditures per capita, as the administration requested, would have been the right thing to do. Instead, this, lim this bill limits all future enrollment fee increases to the cost of living adjustment for military retired pay. Military retirees and their families deserve the best possible care in return for a career of military service and nothing less. But we cannot ignore the fact that health care costs will undermine the combat capability and training and readiness of our military if we don't begin to control the cost growth now. Our committee reflects, a re committee report reflects the desire of the committee to review options for phasing in more realistic future adjustments beginning in fiscal year 2014, and that is exactly what we must do. I want to emphasize a point here. I am solemnly aware of the commitment this nation has made to the men and women who have served in the military regarding health care and benefits. This nation has made promises for many years and has endeavored to keep those promises. But we are faced with a set of dire circumstances regarding the long-term viability of entitlement programs that threatens to undermine a whole range of promises we've made to every American. I'm also keenly aware that in this unprecedented fiscal crisis facing this country, providing for our national defense is the most important responsibility that our or any government has. It is our nation's insurance policy. And in a world that is more complex and threatening as I have ever seen, we cannot allow arbitrary budget arithmetic to drive our defense strategy and spending. We have to look at every program to determine what risk we can afford to take without risking the lives and welfare of those brave young Americans who volunteer to serve in the military. As such, some of the defense cuts being discussed, particularly as a result of sequestration, would do grave harm to our military and our nation's security. The immediate impact of a sequester, according to Secretary Panetta, who previously served as chairman of the House Budget Committee and chief of staff to President Bill Clinton, could be a 23% across-the-board cut to our nation's defense programs. Shipbuilding and construction contracts would have to be curtailed. Civilian personnel and contractors would have to be furloughed. The end results of these costs, after 10 years, would be the smallest ground force since 1940, the smallest number of ships since 1915, and the smallest air force in its history. The United States would face, quote, substantial risk of not being able to meet our defense needs. Defense spending isn't what's sinking this country into fiscal crisis. And if Congress and the President act on that flawed assumption, they will create a situation that is truly unaffordable, 
the decline of U.S. military power and a hollow military. We can't let this happen. Despite a significant decline in defense spending, the growing threats we face around the world demand a strong and resolute United States military that continues as the first line of protection for peace, freedom, justice, and democracy around the world. I've had the privilege of a long career in public service, but in all my years, I don't think I've ever seen a geopolitical environment as complex and as multidimensional as the one we face today. This will only increase in the years to come. The rise of China is one of the most seminal events in world history, but it's not an isolated occurrence. Other nations across the Asia Pacific, most notably India, are also growing rapidly and using their newfound wealth <coughs> to enhance their comprehensive national power, especially new military capabilities. The challenge for the United States is this. How do we, as a historic Pacific power, use the next few years, despite the necessary cuts that will have to be made in our defense spending, to make smart strategic investments that set us up to shape the future of the coming Pacific century? That means a more geographically dispersed and operationally resilient regional force posture. It means developing new operational concepts, such as the Department, Defense Department's air-sea battle concept, which aims to enable us to operate effectively in an anti-access and area denial environment. It means taking advantage of the many opportunities we face to enhance the capabilities and interoperability of our alliances and partnerships. And perhaps most of all, it means making some difficult and at times painful choices about where we can go, what we do, and what we can do without. We all must take responsibility for these choices. When we talk about our increasing focus on the Asia-Pacific region, what this does not mean and cannot mean is a lack of commitment to the broader Middle East. After all, the United States still has the capacity to do at least two things at once, and we cannot afford to allow that to change. The Middle East and North Africa are undergoing perhaps the most consequential period of upheaval since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Governments with long patterns of authoritarian control, some of them our partners, are falling under the popular pressure of millions of citizens who desire dignity, freedom, and opportunity. Our old and dear ally, Israel, faces a more tumultuous and potentially threatening position than it has in decades. At the same time, new regional leaders such as Turkey and Qatar and the UAE are playing a more confident and assertive role in shaping the events of the region. Despite the failure of leadership that led us to the full withdrawal of U.S. troops in Iraq, the success of that country remains a critical national security interest of the United States. And we must remain committed to Iraq's success and stability. And all the while, all the while, the Iranian regime continues to threaten the security of the region and that of the United States. Amid all of these complicated and important global trends, it is absolutely vital that the members of this body be allowed to engage in a fulsome and serious debate about the vital national security interests contained in this bill. I hope there will be a generous opportunity to offer it amendments and debate them. I'm confident that we can do this while still moving diligently and quickly along. We have given the majority leader the commitment that we will work to ensure Senate co consideration of this bill on an expedited basis. This chamber must have the opportunity to complete this bill and then to send it to the conference with the House. We need to have a conference report before the end of the year. We cannot continue to place critical authorizations in appropriations bills or continuing resolutions because we cannot get to the defense authorization bill done in a timely manner. As an example, 
This bill includes extensions for several important counter-narcotics authorities that expired at the end of fiscal year 2011. The expiration of these authorities has had a direct impact on DOD efforts to combat illicit trafficking networks whose proceeds often directly fund the activities of terrorists and other criminal organizations that pose a significant threat to U.S. security interests. Timely passage of the Defense Authorization Bill will ensure that these counter-narcotics missions can continue in places such as Afghanistan, Colombia, and along our southern border. I, for one, am proud of the 9% approval rating of the performance of Congress as determined by various polls. They are right. We need to do more for the American people. I hope we can reverse this downward trend in our approval by, attacking, by tackling the critical national security challenges facing this country in an efficient and effective manner. I look forward to working with Senator Levin to pass this bill as quickly as possible and get it into law for the benefit of our military and our country. And I would ask our colleagues, as we usually do, to get their amendments to us so that we can have them considered and have uh, as prompt action as possible on them. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Madam President, I yield the floor. The Senator from Michigan. Uh, first, let me uh, thank my friend from Arizona for his great work on this bill and the way in which uh, he and our members are brothers and sisters on the committee, including the presiding officer, work so well together on a bipartisan uh, basis. Uh, and uh, the way our staffs work together, uh, we are now uh, in a position where we can consider amendments, as the Senator from Arizona said, uh, and uh, pending the uh, receipt of uh, amendments for our consideration, I would note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. Yeah. And, and the pending business before the Senate. At the this Senate time. is in a quorum call. I ask unanimous consent that further proceedings on the quorum call be suspended with, and ask for what the uh, business without before. Without objection. The Senate is at this time. The pending uh, question is the uh, McCain 11 Amendment number 1092. I think that's the 11 McCain Amendment. Um, could I? That's correct. Um, I'd like to discuss that amendment, uh, and that is, this sort of amendment is a uh, result of the effort made by our committee staff and other members of the committee to identify a very, very serious problem that can affect our, our nation's security. And that is the counterfeiting of critical components uh, that are end up in our uh, defense systems. In, in cases, some cases helicopters, some case aircraft, some case missiles. Uh, literally every high-tech uh, aspect of, uh, of our nation's defense systems. Now, we traced uh, in the hearings uh, under Senator Levin's leadership the way that uh, through different shell companies these parts that originate in China that are counterfeit that end up through various establishments and then by our major parts suppliers and then into our uh, weapon systems. And there already have been occasions where there have been systems failures and there has also been situations which have inhibited or reduced readiness and further capabilities. So far, thank God, it has not uh, resulted in any casualties or deaths, but there is very little doubt that, that this counterfeiting is a, poses a serious threat. And some, according to our findings, some 70% of these counterparts come from China. It's got to be stopped. We don't know, to tell you, that our, my colleagues, the truth, if all the parts of this amendment will stop it because it's a huge money-making business. But I think these initial, uh, this initial amendment will move us in the right direction to try to bring uh, 
uh, at least under some control, the uh, flow of these counterfeit parts into our nation's defense. Um, so I hope that my colleagues, that uh, we could adopt this amendment uh, as rapidly as possible and move on uh, to the next one. I know of no one who is, uh, objects to it. Yeah, I know that there are other members of the committee who were involved in uh, the examination of this situation and would, they would like to come and speak on it, but I would recommend to the chairman that we could move on this amendment as, as quickly as possible. Uh, let me uh, thank the uh, sen the senator from uh, Michigan. Uh, let me thank the senator from Arizona. Um, I very briefly described this amendment before. I'm going to take a few minutes now to describe it in some greater length because uh, it's very significant. It's going to totally change the way we buy replacement parts for our weapon systems to avoid the absurdity that we have so many counterfeit parts including used parts where we need new parts on these weapon systems. Um, the, st the investigative staff of our committee um, looked at just a slice of the defense um, chain for getting replacement parts. And in that one slice of that supply chain, they identified 1,800 examples of where counterfeit parts were in our weapon system. And those are 1,800 different examples, but they involve millions of parts. And what happens here, and this is mostly, uh, these originate from China, is that used computers, what they call e-waste, sent back to China, where they're pulled apart. The electronic parts are then washed frequently in a stream, and there's pictures of these parts being washed in streams, dried out in the open, and then they go mainly to one place in China, Guangzhou, where they are, uh, the surfaces of these parts are sanded down, new surface put on them, number placed on them to make them look like new parts. And then those parts through various ways get into the supply chain. That's what we've got to stop. This is dangerous for our troops. It jeopardizes their missions. There are about, we believe, that we are losing approximately 11,000 American jobs that would be making these parts if they weren't counterfeited overseas. Our semiconductor manufacturers, and that's just one estimate by the Semiconductor Industry Association, lose about seven and a half billion dollars in lost revenue. So there's a safety issue, an emission threat issue here, first and foremost. But there's also, this is a unnecessary and unfair blow to the American economy and to American jobs. Now this is what this bill does, or this amendment does. We're, we're requiring the Secretary of Homeland Security to establish a program of enhanced inspection of electronic parts imported from any country that is determined by the Secretary of Defense to be a significant source of counterfeit parts in the DOD supply chain. What we're also doing in this amendment is to require the Department of Defense and their suppliers to purchase electronic parts from original equipment manufacturers and their authorized dealers or from trusted suppliers who meet established standards for detecting and avoiding counterfeit parts. It requires, uh, it establishes requirements for notification, inspection, testing, and authentication of electronic parts that are not available from such suppliers. It requires the Department of Defense and DOD contractors who become aware of counterfeit parts in the supply chain to provide written notification to the Department of Defense Inspector General, the Contracting Officer, and the Government Industry Data Exchange Program, JIDEP, or a similar program designated by the Secretary of Defense. The amendment would authorize customs to share information with original component manufacturers from electronic parts inspected at the border just to the extent needed to determine whether an item is a counterfeit. It requires large Department of Defense contractors 
to establish systems for detecting and avoiding counterfeit parts in their supply chains, and it authorizes the reduction of contract payments to contractors that fail to develop adequate systems. The amendment requires the Department of Defense to adopt policies and procedures for detecting and avoiding counterfeit parts in its own direct purchases and for assessing and acting upon reports of counterfeit parts from Department of Defense officials and DOD contractors. The amendment authorizes the suspension and debarment of contractors who repeatedly fail to detect and avoid counterfeit parts or otherwise fail to exercise due diligence in the detection and avoidance of counterfeit parts. The amendment also includes a bill that Senator Whitehouse introduced that was passed out of the Judiciary Committee, a bill to toughen criminal sentences for counterfeiting military goods or services. We require the Department of Defense to define the term counterfeit part, which is a critical and long overdue step toward getting a handle on this problem. And we also would make it clear that it's the supplier of the counterfeit part who is going to pay for its replacement and not the taxpayers of the United States. Now, Madam President, this amendment touches the jurisdiction of two or three other committees. And so what we have done is we have sent this amendment to the other committees to try to clear this amendment. Judiciary Committee is one. I think Homeland Security is another. And I believe Finance is a third. And we are hoping that we can get prompt, positive response. But we obviously want to make sure that those other committees are consulted and that they concur. And if not, we would have to then make uh, changes in this, uh, the amendment probably in order to um, accommodate what those concerns are. But there are some jurisdictional issues here, which we are currently working out. I had an opportunity this morning with Senator McCain uh, to talk to Senator Leahy, who is before our committee introducing a nominee uh, to alert him to the fact that we had this amendment, which touched on the jurisdiction of his committee. And I hope by now that the uh, language of the amendment has been uh, shared with the staffs of those three committees. And I think I have them all, but we intend to uh, to do exactly that. So, th to get to the Senator point, you for a question. Sure. Uh, and, and isn't it also true that, uh, as you mentioned, would like to emphasize that Senator Whitehouse's Combating Military Counterfeits Act uh, is a part of this bill? So, hopefully, that would satisfy the, at least the judiciary. I see the distinguished senator from Iowa here. I don't know if he's uh, that he's not uh, going to address this issue, but. Uh, I hope that we can get the uh, committees uh, uh, of jurisdiction involved in this as quickly as possible. I, I don't think it's an issue that uh, we should delay too much longer. Well, we do need to uh, consult with those uh, committees, and we, uh, that is underway, and I'm just hopeful that the, uh, the committees and their leaders would uh, take a prompt look at this and see if there is any uh, problem with the language in here from uh, the perspective of their uh, committees. So at that, Chairman, we'll further yield very, just briefly so we won't uh, voice vote this until we get the uh, sign off of the uh, relevant committee. That, that, uh, that is correct. Thanks. Madam President. The Senate, as if in morning business. Without objection. I'm pleased that the Supreme Court has agreed to hear the arguments in three cases challenging the constitutionality of the health care reform law that Congress passed two years ago. I appreciate that the Obama administration asked the Supreme Court to hear this question. In light of the importance of these cases, I've written to Chief Justice Roberts asking him to provide live audio and video coverage of the oral arguments. The constitutionality of the health care law was the subject of a hearing in the Judiciary Committee last February. Regrettably, the Judiciary Committee would not hold such a hearing until after the bill became law. Those who voted for that law should have given these constitutional questions 
more attention before they voted for the bill. Today, I would like to discuss the issues that are presented in the cases, focusing primarily on the constitutionality of the individual mandate and another recent appellate court ruling on that topic. When Congress passed this law last year, we were told that it would be very popular and truly and clearly constitutional. Neither is true. Polls show that the law remains unpopular. The law's individual mandate provision requires nearly all Americans who do not otherwise have health insurance to purchase such insurance or to pay a monetary penalty. That provision also raises serious constitutional questions about the scope of congressional power to regulate interstate commerce. Normally, the Supreme Court grants only one hour of oral arguments. Here, the constitutional questions associated with the bill are so difficult that the Supreme Court has decided to devote five and one half hours to oral arguments. <clears throat> the answers to the questions are not clear. Besides considering the Commerce Clause question, the court will also hear oral arguments on three other questions. The first is severability. Will the remainder of the law stand if the individual mandate is struck down? Normally, the court does not even consider severability until it has decided that a part of the statute is, in fact, constitutional. That the fact that at least four justices have concerned, have voted to hear arguments on this question should cause uneasiness among those who are confident that the law is constitutional. The second issue is the constitutionality of the law's expansion of the Medicaid program upon the states. And the third is whether procedurally the law can be challenged in the courts before it actually takes effect. There is always the possibility that after all the briefs, all the arguments, and all the public expectations that the Supreme Court will finally resolve whether the health care law is, in fact, constitutional. The court could determine, contrarywise, that it's just too soon for it to rule on the issue because the law hasn't fully gone into effect. Just before the Supreme Court agreed to hear these cases, the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit ruled that the individual mandate was within the constitutional power to regulate interstate commerce. That court concluded this result followed from existing Supreme Court decisions. It also ruled that Congress could therefore require private individuals to purchase any product that Congress chose. The majority opinion was written by Judge Lawrence Silverman. Now, I respect Judge Silverman, but I strongly dispute his ruling and would like to take this opportunity to outline my disagreements with Judge Silverman. I think that Judge Silmer, Silverman has se selectively read Supreme Court decisions. For instance, he noted that no Supreme Court has ever held the Commerce Clause authority is limited to people who are currently engaging in an activity that involves interstate commerce. But it is equally true that no Supreme Court case has ever held that the Commerce Clause covers people who are not engaging in an activity and may never do so in the future. It is not clear why Judge Silberman focused only on the force first formulation and did not consider the second proposition. This omission is even more peculiar when compounded by his omission of the Supreme Court's repeated skepticism of congressional claims that it can exercise a power that it never before discovered in more than 
200 years of our constitutional history. The court has always been wary when a new power is claimed. Judge Silmer, Silberman recognized that the power claimed here to require that uh, the purchase of a product or service is novel. But he did not continue with that next step that the Supreme Court would have taken. Instead, the judge concluded that the argument against the power was equally novel. I think it is common sense no one would have made such an argument if Congress had not claimed this power. For instance, when the Supreme Court in the Plot case ruled that Congress could not reinstate a statute of limitations once it had expired, it pointed out that Congress had never done that before. It did not belittle the argument against the practice by characterizing it, as Judge Silberman did, as novel. In fact, the argument against the novel claim power won. Judge Silberman stated that Congress cannot regulate non-economic behavior based on a weak link to interstate commerce. And he ruled that Congress cannot regulate intrastate economic activity that in the aggregate does not substantially affect interstate commerce. Now, agreeing with Judge Silberman, so far so good. But then he found that decisions whether to purchase health insurance, but then he found that decisions whether to purchase health insurance do affect interstate commerce. However, the Supreme Court has never ruled that Congress can regulate decisions, in other words, thoughts, on whether or not to purchase a good or service. The court for decades has referred to the power of Congress to regulate activities that affect interstate commerce. Since Congress cannot regulate non-economic activities or interstate economic activities that have no combined effect on Congress, then it follows naturally that Congress cannot regulate at all in activity like refraining from buying a product. Judge Silverman considered the activity argument, and in my mind, he repeated an earlier error. He concluded that no Supreme Court case had ever said that existing activity was necessary for Congress to exercise its power to regulate interstate commerce. But it is just as true that many Supreme Court cases have described the kinds of activities that Congress may regulate under the Commerce Clause. Judge Silverman could have just as accurately found that no Supreme Court case has ever held that Congress has the power to regulate commerce in the absence of an activity. Another way Judge Silverman selectively read the Supreme Court precedents is that he could have struck down the individual mandate consistent with all Supreme Court precedents. This point was confirmed in the Judiciary Committee hearing that we held in February. I asked the witnesses whether the Supreme Court could strike down the individual mandate without overruling any of these precedents. The Republican witnesses both responded that the court could do so. The Democrat witnesses identified no cases that would have been overturned. So, not only is the individual mandate unconstitutional, but the Supreme Court could strike it down without overturning any of its precedents. Now, Judge Silverman disagreed. He said that the mandate here is close to the facts of the Wickard versus Filburn, a famous 1942 Supreme Court decision that broadly read the powers of Congress to regulate interstate commerce. The court here, uh, the court then upheld the second Agricultural Adjustment Act, 
Under that law, a farmer could be penalized for growing wheat on his own farm, even for the use of his own family and livestock. And he couldn't grow that wheat if he exceeded his wheat quota. The homegrown wheat substituted for the wheat that the farmer otherwise would have had to purchase on the open market. So the court concluded that that would depress the price of wheat when combined with the actions of similar farmers all across the country. So obviously, in Filburn, that farmer affected interstate commerce. Now that may not make sense to us today, but it made sense in 1942, and it's still a precedent. Judge Silverman, however, ruled that the regulation at issue in that case is very similar to the individual mandate, which is an inactivity if you decide not to, not to purchase it, and that any activity involved in the Wicker case was incidental to simply owning a farm. Now, I take issue with that. The Wicker case differs conceptually from the individual mandate. Farmer Filburn, in 1942, could avoid the regulation by ceasing to farm, by no longer engaging in the regulated activity. In fact, that is true in all of the cases that Judge Silverman cited. A person can avoid laws penalizing cultivation of marijuana by not cultivating marijuana. A person can avoid laws criminalizing child pornography by not downloading child pornography. A person can avoid public accommodation regulations by not operating a public accommodation. Those are activities that Congress can constitutionally regulate under the Commerce Clause. But that's not the case with the individual mandate. You cannot avoid being subject to that mandate. If you exist, if you're alive, an individual in this country, you are regulated. And of course, that's not, not the situation with respect to any other decisions that Judge Silverman cited. It is why he is, respectfully, wrong to find that the infringement on liberty are the same in those cases as they are in the individual mandate. The liberty of avoiding the regulation was preserved in the laws at issue in those cases. Liberty would prevail because you didn't have to abide by the law if you wasn't in that business. But not so with the individual mandate under the health care reform bill. Moreover, I disagree with Judge Silverman's assertion that it is for political reasons and not constitutional ones that it took until 2010 for Congress to conclude that the Constitution allows it to force people to buy goods or services. If this power truly existed, Congress would have exercised it frequently and long ago. Why would Congress pass tax incentives to encourage people to buy hybrids if Congress could simply order you or anybody else to buy hybrids? Why would Congress give strong incentives for farmers not to grow wheat so as to keep the price up when it could force people, the consumer, just simply to buy wheat? Why could it not raise the price of beef by requiring vegetarians to purchase it so long as it did not require them to eat that beef? Why would Congress take the political heat for raising taxes when it could order some people to pay third parties for goods and services? Even more sinister, members of Congress could use this supposed power under the Commerce Clause to entrench ourselves in office. Congress could require that the goods and services that Americans must purchase be limited to those providers who contribute to the political parties of the members. 
or it could prohibit purchases from those providers who contribute to the other political party. It could require people to buy houses or cars or other products in areas where the political party has its base of support. Sounds a little bit like Mussolini's Italy, doesn't it? But the Supreme Court's Lopez decision Before the Lopez decision, there were people who believed that Wickard versus Filborn in 1940, since 1942 gave Congress the ability to regulate anything that Congress chose to regulate. Then in the Lopez case, the Supreme Court ruled that the Commerce Clause did not per permit Congress to regulate the possession of handguns near schools. At the time, there was widespread fear among liberals that the power of Congress to regulate interstate commerce would be jeopardized. Those fears did not materialize. Similarly, today, people like Judge Silverman, again, believe that Wickard versus Filburn gives Congress the ability to regulate nearly anything it chooses, and therefore, the individual mandate must be upheld. I do not agree. Where I give Judge Silberman credit is, and if you knew the man, you'd know this is his character, intellectual honesty. Unlike the Obama administration, Judge Silberman recognizes the truth. If Congress can force people to buy health insurance, he admits it can force people to buy any goods or services. It can regulate inactivity because it can affect interstate commerce. This is consistent with the opinion of the Congressional Budget Office, which wrote in a 1994 memorandum that, quote, a mandate issuing government could lead in the extreme to a command economy in which the President and the Congress dictated how much each individual and family spent on all goods or services. That's not the American that our Constitution writers envisioned. At the oral arguments in the D.C. Circuit, the judge asked the Obama administration lawyer if Congress could require con Americans to buy broccoli or to buy cars to keep General Motors in business or to set up mandatory retirement accounts in place of Social Security. The lawyer weaseled an answer saying that, quote, it would depend, end of quote. Now, that is not a principled position on the nature of the supposed powers of Congress, which has no limit. Judge Silverman is a former ambassador of what used to be Yugoslavia. He understands the difference between a command economy and a free market economy. What his decision implicitly states is that Will Wickard versus Filburn permits Congress to enact a command economy with no individual economic freedom whatsoever. But our Constitution provides protections for private property and for contracts. It establishes some form of a free market system. Judge Silverman's interpretation may imply that Wickard versus Filburn was wrongly decided and should be overturned. But I do not believe that it is necessary to overrule that decision any more than it was necessary to reverse uh, the Wickard or the Filburn case when they decided the Lopez case. Apart from cases, we need to go back to the basics. We should consider first principles in evaluating the constitutionality of the individual mandate in the health care reform bill. The people are sovereign in our country. The government serves the people, not the other way around. That is enforced through our Constitution. And that Constitution gives Congress just limited powers. In the Federalist Papers, James Madison wrote that the powers of the federal government are few 
and are defined, and the powers of the states are many and are undefined. Although there is much more interstate commerce in today's economy than there was in 1787, the power is still limited. If Congress can require Americans to purchase goods and services that Congress chooses without a limiting principle, then there is no limited federal government. There would be no issue that Congress could not address at the federal level. There would be no range of state powers that the federal government cannot usurp. And there would be no individual economic autonomy that the federal government must respect. Surely, the Constitution would not have been ratified if Americans had understood it to permit such a result. Mr. President, the upcoming Supreme Court decisions on constitutionality of the individual mandate are important, not only for the fate of that provision, but for their effect on the powers of the federal government and for the very survival of individual economic activity.